Welcome everyone. I am Charlie Matthews, the CEO of Empowering Pumps and Equipment, and this is our knowledge shared se uh, series on economic and labor market updates. We're going to really focus in on that labor market uh, update now. Uh, Alex has done two episodes previous to this one. If you haven't seen that one, please go back and take a look at that. Um, I loved it. I love the macro and really looking at the whole picture, diving into the industrial sector. Um, so both of those have been really helpful for me personally, and I look forward to sharing that with everyone else. But now, Alex, let's talk about the labor market. Absolutely. Let's talk about the labor market. And what I can say at the start is that the labor market has proven remarkably resilient, even compared to what the expectations were at the end of 2022, you know, for the slowdown that was going to manifest in early 23, it just didn't happen. You know, when we look at January's figures, we added something like 472,000 jobs in February, that number came down, but it was still around 300,000. And with the latest set of data that just came out for March, what we saw is that 236,000 jobs are still added in the US economy at the end of Q1, the unemployment rate actually ticked down to the pre-pandemic low of 3.5%. And in good news, average hourly earnings also continued their deceleration to 4.2%. So let's just take a second and kind of unpack each one of these numbers in their own accord. 236,000 jobs might seem smaller than the 300K in February or the 472,000 in uh, January. But keep in mind that pre-pandemic in 18, 19, any month where the U.S. economy added 200,000 jobs was indicative of a very healthy, vibrant labor market. And so we're still above that, even despite all of the talk of recessionary conditions and all the headwinds that the U.S. economy has been fighting regarding inflation and interest rates and all of the things that we've been talking about incessantly over the last 12 months. So to have a reading of 236,000 for March 2023, in my view, still reflects a job market that is very healthy. It is coming down off of the uh, unprecedentedly high numbers that we were seeing in 2021 and 2022, but that's a good thing, right? We Hopefully what this means is that companies, particularly the small and medium-sized businesses that tend to be uh, the preponderance of empowering power pumps and equipment uh, member companies, they're actually going to have some access to talent that they couldn't access in the past. So, you know, I'm not trying to minimize the impact of the layoffs that have been going on. Obviously, we've all read about them, you know, the latest round, you know, whether it's Disney or Netflix or Meta or Amazon or Apple. I mean, all of these people are losing their jobs. And that's obviously a very difficult thing for the individual. But keep in mind, you add up all of those announcements over the last year or so, and it's still less than 100,000 people in total. So when you compare that to the 236,000 jobs that we added just in the month of March alone, you can kind of get some context for what's actually going on in the labor market. And it's not doom and gloom out there. It is actually remaining quite healthy and vibrant. Now, I do believe that with, as you will have heard in episode two, with that pending mild recession that we're expecting for the industrial economy, these numbers should continue to come down over the coming months and probably several quarters. But again, after a year or two years in 21 and 22, when we had just completely bonkers numbers coming out of the labor market, and we had a difference of like over 5 million people between the number of folks looking for work and the number of jobs actually available, this is a good thing. It's going to allow for some slack in labor market conditions. And as I mentioned previously, I actually think particularly for the small and medium-sized enterprises, this will give them access to talent that they didn't have over the last two years. The unemployment rate, 3.5%. I mean, it is remarkable how uh, how healthy that number is despite all of the negativity and all the challenges that we have in the economy right now. Uh, the expectations here are also that the unemployment rate does rise over the next year or so. If you look at the different pundits, the expectations are anywhere between a year-end 2023 uh, total of somewhere between 4 and 5%, with kind of the, the average being around 4.5%. Certainly, the Fed shares that view. But keep in mind, there's you know approximately 180 million people of working age in the United States, and a 1% increase in the unemployment rate is still not going to 
cover all of that delta, the gap that exists between the people looking for work and the amount of work that's available out there. So I don't expect that it's going to swing the pendulum all of a sudden into an employer driven market, right? People are, companies are still going to have to be competitive in terms of attracting, hiring and retaining the talent that they need. And they can't just hit cruise control and expect massive amounts of applicants to all of a sudden swarm their, their portals, right? You're going to have to put, put in the work. It might actually pan out into something productive for you, whereas over the last two years, it might not have, but it's still going to be something that you're going to have to have to work very hard on. The fact that the average hourly earnings are coming down is encouraging because it means that the, the despite the fact that your labor pool is going to cost you more, it's not going to be as big of an increase as what you experienced over the last two years. So if you're in the business of COLA, right, the cost of living adjustment uh, raises. Uh, last year, if you did anything less than 7 or 8%, your people were essentially falling behind relative to the inflationary pressure that they feel. Now you're going to be able to give uh, raises that are a little bit more in line with historical norms. Now, you're not going to be able to do 1.5% to 2% the way that you did in 16, 17, 18, but 3 to 4% might get you, you know, enough of a buy-in from your folks this year relative to where, what you had to do last year. And that's going to be uh, in line, obviously, with where the inflation expectations are headed by the end of this year as well. So if you want to differentiate yourself, if you want to be viewed as an above average employer, I certainly still recommend looking at giving raises that are beyond the inflationary pressure. That's really the only thing that people are going to look to to say, am I getting ahead or am I just keeping up with the cost of life? Um, so that's going to be something that you have to consider on a case by case basis, whether there's merit there or if you're just you know looking to keep the people that you have, it's going to still cost you more, just not as much as it costs in 21 and in 22. When we break down that 236,000 number in terms of where the job additions came from, the vast majority is still happening in the kind of frontline positions. So you can see the, the leadership sectors, leisure and hospitality added 72,000 jobs, education and health services added 65,000 jobs, professional and business services, nearly 40,000. And if you look towards the bottom of this chart, you can see where the pain is really starting to be felt. And in particular, I, I think that it's easy to understand that retail trail trade is pairing back some after a holiday season where there's a lot of contract workers and a lot of temporary workers. But the, the fact that we're now starting to see minor but still negative numbers in the manufacturing and construction industry this, we haven't seen negative numbers in these two sectors in a very, very long time, several years. This is really showing some of that weakness that we talked about in the previous episode that companies are looking to, uh, in particular, I don't think we're seeing layoffs in the sector, significant layoffs. But we, what we are seeing is companies are allowing some attrition to take place without necessarily replacing those folks uh, as quickly as they would have in 21 and 22. So uh, I believe that this manufacturing number is essentially indicative of a flat market. Um, I think th these numbers get revised every single month and it could be mildly positive at next month's issuance. But the fact of the matter is, you know, if we look at the previous six months, we were looking, uh, we were adding somewhere between 20 and 30,000 jobs in manufacturing and construction. We're now seeing a different environment emerge in that space. And it is likely the bigger companies, the publicly traded multi-billion multinational type of companies that are driving a lot of this negativity because as Miller Resource Group, we are a recruiting company working primarily with small and medium-sized enterprises and none of our clients are cutting back. They're actually taking this opportunity to add headcount, maybe not aggressively as they were over the last two years, but certainly looking to grow and, and to pick up some of that talent that's leaving the big public companies at hopefully a bit of a discount given what's going on in the macro environment. The job openings that are poured out by the Bureau of Labor Statistics are also coming down, but as you can see here, they are near 10 million still, which is still much, much higher than anything that we've seen historically pre-pandemic. And the, the breakdown of that 10 million openings, you know, nearly 2 million each in education and healthcare, in professional and business services, in leisure and hospitality, a million open government jobs. And yet, even in those uh, segments that we just saw where we're seeing contraction, right, there are still 694,000 jobs open in manufacturing, 
412,000 jobs open in construction. So perhaps what's happening is that we're not seeing as aggressive additional headcount plans, but they are still uh, kind of uh, refilling the positions that become open because quit rates actually went up last month. And so people are still leaving their, their jobs. So we're, we have this rebalancing of the market that's happening right now. And again, as I've said in the last two episodes, that's a healthy thing. We could not have maintained the trajectory that we saw over the course of 21 and 22 when it came to the job market forever. It, it, it was destined to come down. You can see it's doing so in a fairly gradual pace, which is what I think the Fed wants with its interest rate policy. And the fact that these numbers are starting to come down, combined with the fact that inflationary pressure is receding as well, is going to give, I think, the ammunition to the Fed to start curtailing some of that interest rate hikes that we've seen over the last year, and potentially even considering uh, at some point lowering interest rates, which will be good uh, in terms of stimulating business and investment activity. So this 9.9 .9 million job openings still has to be weighed against the six and a half million people out there right now actively looking for work. And you can see that creates a, a delta or a gap of about three and a half million positions that we simply don't have the bodies for. And so that's going to that's why I think it's really important for companies to try to differentiate themselves relative to both their peers in their industry and the labor market as a whole. I, I use the analogy of running away from the bear, right? You don't have to outrun the bear itself. You just have to outrun everyone else running away from the bear. And that's certainly an apt way to talk about kind of the dynamics in the labor market right now. You have to be better. You have to be more attractive. You have to be better, more efficient, and more communicative in your hiring process. And you have to have good culture and you have to give people reasons to want to stay at your organization. So just because the macro environment is softening and is likely headed for a mild recession, that doesn't mean that you can get away from thinking about your business in that context. There's still a candidate-driven market out there. And if you want to be known as a best-in-class employer, you've got to put energy, effort, and resources behind your talent strategy. So this ratio, 0 0.65, is actually the number of unemployed per job opening. And you can see even the fact that we did see a little bit of a tick up here by historic standards, we're nowhere near where we need to be. This this line is kind of the, the, the pre-pandemic norm. Uh, what we see here at one and a half is kind of what was normal before the Great Recession. And in the 14, 15 uh, timeframe, then when we got into 16, 17, we were kind of hovering around that, that one mark. And then we crossed below the threshold. And where we are today, as you can see, still, historically speaking, is a very, very low ratio here, which means that you have to be better than your competitors in order to be able to attract, hire, and retain people in your industry. A big part of that, based on what's been going on, what we've talked about in terms of inflation, is are the offers that you are giving your incoming candidates actually competitive? How do you know what the current market rates are when it comes to the salaries that you're paying people. Well, you have to be data-driven in your perspective on this. One of the tools that I highlighted last year that has been extremely powerful, and I've worked with both trade associations and individual companies to help them make better compensation decisions, it's called Labor IQ. It's something that individual companies can access that you can also come to me and I can help you understand what are the fair market wages that you should be paying people at this stage of the game. And that's based on the specific industry that you're in. It's based on the current supply of available talent in that particular marketplace. And it's based on the other elements of that particular employee. So uh, their experience, their education, the location of the job, and then the size of your business matters too, the number of employees that you have and the revenue range of your business. Because it's important to recognize that smaller companies can't pay as much as larger companies do. And so all of these things put into the platform give us some great recommendation. For example, in this case, we're looking at a control engineer with six to eight years of experience, a bachelor's degree, and in the Dallas-Fort Worth met Metroplex area working in material handling. Well, for a company between 100 and 250 employees making between 10 and $50 million in annual revenue, the recommended salary for that engineer is somewhere around $100,000, despite the fact that the median salary is only just above $80,000. And that's because there's a significant shortage 
of these individuals out there in the marketplace today. So you can see here the bell curve of how kind of the distribution of salaries is. If you want to be in the top quartile of all employers paying for this person, you better start paying them $99,114 or more, or else you're going to certainly not be able to make that claim that you're in the top quartile of compensation in this particular case. Not only for your new positions, but as we look towards the next 12 months, the focus increasingly shifts towards your existing workforce. And it is really important for every company to understand where are their vulnerabilities. So one of the things that I've been helping a lot of businesses do is look at their overall uh, uh, compensation strategy, get readings on what they're currently paying people and help them identify who is really making substantially below the competitive market rates today so that they can engage those individuals in conversations and at least put together a plan for how they can right the ship. You can see here, this is a sampling that I recently did for one company. There are people here that are making, you know, as much as 50% below the current market rate, right? Now, if someone's at minus 4%, that's not a significant problem. But if someone's at minus 30, minus 50, minus 41, minus 42, these are big areas. And these are the people, as I mentioned earlier, the quit rate actually ticked up in the month of March. But these are the people that are the likeliest to depart your organization and seek better paying opportunities somewhere else. So identify vulnerabilities. This soft patch that we've been talking about is not severe enough or long enough for you to be able to afford to lose these individuals and then rehire them in 2024 when things start to improve. They're going to be uh, gone from the marketplace. So your, your focus should basically be keeping the people that you have, particularly if they're a key impact player in your organization. And a part of that is understanding what is going to get them to stay from a salary component perspective. The other thing that you have to understand is the same position can be offering very different wages depending on the industry that it's in. So one of the top positions being sought after right now is HR manager. And you can see if you're in food manufacturing as an HR manager, you might get $98,644 as a starting salary. But if you go, if the same person goes over to a finance and insurance company, they're getting nearly $120,000 to start. So you're not just competing with folks within your industry, you're competing with people in other industries as well. And so that's an important notion that you have to keep in the back of your mind as you think about how much or, or uh, to, to pay people, how much to, uh, to issue as raises over the course of this year, and the implications of all of that to the, the payroll costs that you have to incur uh, over the course of 2023. So all of that having been said, uh, I think it's really key for you to remember that it is important to be counter cyclical and counter intuitive when it comes to talent. As we approach a low point in the business cycle, you have to actually recognize that this presents you with fantastic opportunities to add talented, impactful individuals, oftentimes that wouldn't be available in the marketplace during periods of boom. And you can also get them at a discounted rate relative to what you would have had to pay them in 2022 or what you might have to pay them in 2024 when the macro condition is more bullish and more optimistic. So when you think about that talent, you have to develop partners and apps help you with insights and information that you don't have access to uh, yourself. When it comes to the actual candidates, when it comes to the actual candidates, you have to make sure that you find uh, a be a to potential employees. Part of it is treating attractiveness a marketing function. You really have to shout from the rooftops why somebody would want to come and work for you. And you have to really work hard to understand candidate priorities. What motivates those individuals to come and seek a job at your company? And then talk to the things that are really going to resonate with those people. In the hiring process, let's say you get them through the door and they come in for an interview, you have to be very efficient and you have to be a great communicator. Seek to have a touch point with a candidate at least every three days, meaning a LinkedIn message, a phone call, an email, a text, some way to let them know that you're still interested. 
and compress that interview process down to two or three maximum, because if you're still going through four or five or more interviews, you're likely losing those candidates because other companies have just figured out how to be more efficient with their time. Lastly, when it comes to retention, you really have to dismiss this notion that you don't have to listen to people as well, that there's just going to be happy with job security and you can treat them in any way that you can during uh, recessionary periods. That's not true. There's still a disconnect in the labor market. They will seek better uh, places elsewhere. And so take the time, invest the necessary resources, ask your folks, what do they think about working for you? And then come with an open mind and an open ear, be willing to take constructive criticism and actually act upon that in order to have the best chance of keeping the people that you have. Because otherwise you're gonna lose them. That uh, Again, that's the dynamic of the labor market today is there is choice, there is opportunity out there and people that are getting mistreated, even in a period of soft economic conditions are going to seek better places to work. So with that, uh, that's the end of the series. I did want to throw up the QR code to my LinkedIn page here. Please connect with me, engage if you have questions. And Charlie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, again, such a great resource for everybody. So I hope that they will um, take advantage of that, connect with you. Of course, we'll put that in all of our previous sessions as well. And, you know, I think you, you covered it by, you know, talking about the, the the talent, they're people. Remember that, you know, we have to treat people and understand the people that work with us. And so that communication is key there. So Alex, thanks again for all of your help. Um, this is such a great resource for everyone. Um, thanks for letting us have it here at Empowering Pumps and Equipment and look forward to next time. Thank you so much, Charlie. Take care.